Welcome back for Microbiology uh, 3010. Uh, we are up to Chapter 20, which is about um, antibiotics. So that'll be a fun chapter uh, to learn about all the drugs that are used to treat different uh, types of infections. There's our artistic micrograph for this chapter. Some Pseudomonas aeruginosa, very terrible guys. Uh, it's funny, they are they false color to them blue and they do produce a uh, pigment that makes them makes tissues look blue green sometimes when during infections of say burn patients <clears throat> so how about some terminology chemotherapy is a term coined by uh, paul ehrlich to describe his use of the very first antibiotic instead of calling it antibiotics he called it chemotherapy and he developed a drug that would God treats syphilis, treponema pallidum, and he, he had this idea of chemotherapy as what you call anytime you treat any disease with a chemical, chemotherapy. We, of course, use that term almost exclusively today, colloquially, to mean uh, anti-cancer drugs. <clears throat> Antimicrobial drugs are what we're largely going to be talking about in this chapter, and the idea with them is to try to find a way to interfere with the growth of the microbe without harming the host cells, and that's a trick. Antibiotics specifically mean antimicrobial substances produced by uh, microorganisms. So we isolate most of the antibiotics we have come from bacteria or fungi, so they're antibiotics. So the idea is to, to develop selective toxicity. We need to find a chemical or a drug that will harm the microbes without damaging the host. That works best with bacteria because bacteria, everything about bacteria metabolically is very different from eukaryotic cells of our own bodies. And so we can find, for example, a big, a major target area is the 70S ribosome because it's very, very different than the 80S ribosome of eukaryotic cells. So the more similar the, ho the parasite is to the host, however, the more trouble arises and there's fewer drugs to prevent uh, fungal infections and protozoa because they are eukaryotes and their cells have a lot of machinery in common with, with the host cell, so it makes it a lot trickier just to find those targets to exploit without too much toxicity. <clears throat> Antiviral drugs are the hardest of all because they use the host cell itself as their, as their factory for reproduction. And, and so you have to find ways of targeting very narrowly different things like enzymes that are introduced into the cell by the virus, preventing the virus from uh, being able to enter the cells in the first place, what kind of stuff. We'll see some different examples, but it's, that becomes a real trick. <clears throat> so I guess I posed it as a question. I've already answered it. There I go. Um, all right. Here's a little diagram that we've seen before about a, <clears throat> a drug acting like a haptin. Some antibiotics can act as a haptin and then w and wind up causing an immune response against uh, cells in our own body, such as platelets. And here we see that picture of uh, antibody-induced um, thrombocytopenia. History lesson. Um, again, the very first antibiotic was actually not penicillin, but it's the first one that we really usually refer to. <clears throat> Very effective um, dis discovery, but not right away. So Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin by accident when he got contamination of mold in his petri dishes in which he was growing bacteria on agar. And he noticed there was a zone of inhibition around the, 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 the fungus colony. And he realized there the, the, the fungi were producing um, something that would inhibit bacterial growth, and ultimately it was isolated, <coughs> and prepared for clinical trials uh, some years later. It took a while to be able to grow up enough penicillium and to find out what was the active ingredient and to purify it and so forth. Meanwhile, this fellow Gerhard Domach um, discovered sulfa drugs, sulfanilamide, which is a competitive inhibitor of a uh, dihydrofolate pathway in the metabolism of bacteria. And so um, that became uh, readily available as a synthetic drug and it could be made in large amounts. 
and uh, was used to treat <coughs> a whole host of infections, so it was very effective. There you can see uh, bacterial colonies. The, the white is the lawns of bacteria, and then these white colonies are fungi that have produced an inhibitory substance, in this case, the, the penicillin from penicillium fungi. Um, <clears throat> where do we get antibiotics from? Here's a list of some uh, antibiotics we mentioned in this chapter. Bacillus subtilis, we know that genus of bacteria bacillus, bacitracin, we'll see later. Um, peptide antibiotic, uh, polymyxin. Look at all the streptomyces. Streptomyces, streptomyces, streptomyces here and here. So more than half of the antibiotics, as we'll mention in another slide, are produced by streptomyces. That question will come up. But a lot of the most important antibiotics, as you see in this list, and antifungals come from microorganisms. Mostly what happens is we isolate antibiotics from microorganisms and then ultimately make chemical modifications of those things to change their, their host range or their, their target range or make them uh, um, last longer in the body, uh, less resistant, uh, bacteria have less resistance to them and things like that. So <clears throat> some antibiotics work on a lot of different types of microorganisms. They're called broad spectrum. Some are narrow spectrum. A lot of antibiotics that we have are essentially uh, functional only against gram-positive bacteria, for example, those are considered narrow spectrum. Super infections. All right, here's a little diagram illustrating the um, range of targets for different antibiotics. So we can see um, here's penicillin G, gram-positive bacteria only. Ketoconazole, an azole antifungal, so it's limited to fungi, very narrow spectrum, but very important, nevertheless. Um, Methylquin um, against protozoa. Uh, isoniazid and some other ones we'll discover are useful against mycobacterium species, so that's pretty narrow spectrum, but again, very, very important because we have a problem with tuberculosis. Uh, in comparison, look at tetracycline can kill gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria and mycobacteria, so it's a very a broad spectrum drug. Streptomyosin is a little more broad spectrum than, than some because it can kill mycobacteria as well as gram negative bacteria. Just for fun. So <clears throat> um, there's a difference that we should note. We've actually come across these definitions before. Bactericidal. Bactericidal means killing microbes. So some antibiotics are that way. Some antibiotics are just bacteriostatic and they prevent the microbes from growing and so the infection is halted. They don't actually kill the microorganisms. Um, what are the mechanisms of action? We'll mention several different things uh, that antibiotics can do to disrupt the life cycle of, of microorganisms. Inhibiting cell wall synthesis, very important one. Penicillins and this whole, look at all this list of antibiotics that have that, that mechanism of action prevent um, peptidoglycan production. <clears throat> Inhibition of protein synthesis, some very important antibiotics, right? We can target that 70S ribosome and, uh, and block the production of proteins in bacteria while allowing the 80S ribosome of the host cells to continue functioning normally. Um, disruption of the plasma membrane, polymyxins and polyenes. Polyenes are specifically for uh, fungi, whereas polymyxins for bacteria. Inhibition of metabolic pathways. Sulfa drugs, sulfonamides, uh, and trimethoprim uh, and dapsone are all competitive inhibitors of metabolism. These first two are competitive inhibitors of dihydrofolate production, which is needed by the cells for uh, energy production and, and growth and so forth. Um, inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis, some very important drugs that can block um, nucleic acid synthesis, specifically of microorganisms or of cells infected by microorganisms or by viruses, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, there's even some drugs that can block attachment to the host cell, uh, and, and we'll mention those briefly at some point during this chapter. So I just highlighted the, the titles of each one of these little, these little paragraphs because they're kind of like small font. So I would like you to remember these different categories and be able to say something, give an example or two of 
antibiotics that work in each of these ways. They'll explain what it means and what are some examples of those. So here's a little diagram reminding us what does um, um, peptidoglycan look like as it's being produced. And we have peptide cross-linked peptide chains um, or peptides and then linked onto these uh, polysaccharides. And um, uh, penicillins work by blocking an enzyme called transpeptidase that connects each one of these uh, peptide chains is just like this green vertical part and then this blue horizontal part and then the next green vertical part is the next separate um, uh, peptide chain and they're linked together covalently by this enzyme transpeptidase blocked by um, penicillin. So the cell wall can't be produced adequately. And remember, bacteria cannot control their osmolarity. And without a strong cell wall, they'll just lice because they have too much osmotic pressure inside. So here we see some bacteria uh, being lysed by uh, penicillin. that's depriving them of that nice stiff cell wall. That, and they have a lot of osmotic pressure. So water enters by osmosis. Boom. <clears throat> so penicillin depends on those growing cells uh, and their failure to make their proper cell wall and then they die. Um, here's a table of some, of some various um, important antibiotics. There's some more that we'll look at that are not in this table, but uh, penicillins, so a couple of penicillins. Penicillin has been modified. Semi-synthetic pen penicillins are ones that have been used to alter the properties of penicillin. So you can see this, I highlighted this little list here <clears throat> of semi-synthetic pe penicillins, um, oxacillin resistant to penicillinase. So penicillins were used early and, and for a lot of different infections and resistance became common. And so they began to modify the penicillin chemically and found that they could uh, make it less resistant, make it resistant to the, to the penicillinase, which is the enzyme that the bacteria used to destroy penicillin so that they can be resistant or survive it. Ampicillin, more broad spectrum penicillins, are useful against gram positive only. So now we have a, a similar type of, a, of an antibiotic, but it's broad spectrum. Uh, anyway, you can go right down that list and see how they've uh, improved on it in a sense uh, change, by changing its properties by chemical modification. Cephalosporins, we'll talk about those. We'll talk about all these. I'm not going to go through this whole table because what we'll do is take a look at each one of these in turn, just mention one or two things about them. <clears throat> I don't want to get too carried away with details, but uh, we'll say something about them. We see some antimycobacterial antibiotics, a couple right there uh, for, for tuberculosis uh, and uh, leprosy, Hansen's disease. All right. So here's a, uh, here is a, diagram just reminding us about uh, protein translation. We have a messenger RNA coming into a ribosome. This is a cool like uh, anatomically correct drawing of a ribosome instead of just like a little couple of balls together. Anyway, the, the, <clears throat> the messenger RNA is being read through this ribosome and it's producing a growing peptide chain. And there's uh, just giving you an example of three different antibiotics that work differently on inhibiting the 70S ribosome of bacteria, chloramphenicol, binds to the 50S portion and prevents the formation of the peptide bond. So a new transfer RNA comes in. We're supposed to be able to covalently link that next amino acid onto the chain. Blocked. Tetracyclines interfere with the attachment of the tra transfer RNAs to the ribosome and the RNA. So the new ter uh, transfer uh, RNA comes in with an amino acid can't bind. And so tetracyclines block protein synthesis. Uh, streptomycin uh, changes it, twists the, uh, de deforms the 30S uh, portion of the ribosome, and so we don't have the proper reading through of the messenger RNA. So anyway, just to, you don't need to memorize that, just three different ways. Just the way, the fact is that the 70S ribosome is so different from those in eukaryotic cells that can target those with a number of different antibiotics that do their thing. <clears throat> again, even a little bit larger table of different types of antibiotics. Um, we'll mention again, each one of these, we'll just say something about them in the following um, slides to mention what they're used for and what their sort of properties are that make them uh, good antibiotics and what their host range is and so forth. Um, <clears throat> sulfa drugs and sulfa meth um, and, and trimethoprim. Sulfanilamide and trimethoprim work by this particular uh, sulfanilamide. You can see how similar it is to this 
paraminobenzoic acid, it's uh, it's a competitive inhibitor, and, and, this, and the bacterial cells need this uh, a reaction with this PABA in order to be able to make dihydrofolate, and that's an intermediate that's needed for needed for a lot of metabolic pathways, and the sulfonylamide blocks it, so it's it's a, a metabolism inhibitor. And the trimethoprim works on a different part, part of the pathway of making um, dihydrofolate. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, major action of antimicrobial drugs, um, just kind of listed out around this uh, drawing of a bacterium, just to remind us the same things we saw in that earlier slide where I wrote the, the red titles in, um, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, penicillins, Right, we've known that for a long time inhibits peptidoglycan production, but also cephalosporins, bacitracin, a peptide antibiotic, and vancomycin. Inhibition of protein synthesis, we just saw a couple of them listed out, chloramphenicol, tetracyclines, and streptomycin, but also erythromycin, so there's some important antibiotics. Uh, inhibition of uh, metabolite synthesis, we just mentioned those, sulfonylamide, or sulfonamides, or sulfa drugs for short, and trimethoprim, they block the hydrofolate um, metabolism. <clears throat> and inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis, quinolones, or fluoroquinolones like cipro, ciprofloxacin, as we'll see, you might have heard of that one, and rifampin, block nucleic acid synthesis. All right, so penicillin, <clears throat> the natural penicillin, was produced and manufactured and, and made available and was a very important step in the progress towards a, 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 a antibiotic uh, healthy society. Um, Semi-synthetic penicillins, we saw a quick list of some of those that were used to change the properties of penicillin to improve on its either its host range or its ability to survive in the presence of resistant bacteria and so forth. Uh, and here's some um, penicillin G and penicillin V, um, <clears throat> different, slightly different chemical structures uh, that we see here uh, between these two that changes the, the, the properties of the penicillin. Here's a semi-synthetic penicillin, oxacillin. Uh, we've got a little bit of change if we look carefully at this structure and then look at this structure. You can see, look down here, you can see there's another ring right here and it changes the properties and it's resistant to penicillinase. That's the, again, that's the enzyme produced by bacteria that normally breaks open this beta-lactam ring. I should have mentioned that, that the, these antibiotics uh, require this beta-lactam ring. That's how they act as an inhibitor of the enzyme that normally cross-links the, uh, the peptide chains in the peptidoglycan cell wall. So that beta-lactam ring is very important. And so um, penicillinase, another name for it is beta-lactamase. There's a better name for that enzyme. It breaks open these rings and then it no longer has its antibiotic function. Ampicillin <clears throat> has extended uh, extended host range. It works on both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So here we see penicillins and then we have a little modification here. We have an amine group. That's basically the big change. It's putting an amine group right there and then it will now uh, be more effective against gram-negative bacteria. And uh, different forms of penicillin uh, and their <clears throat> concentration in the blood after uh, after um, uh, dosing. And you can see that um, penicillin G, natural penicillin, is taken up into the blood very, very quickly and then declines very, very quickly. So that's it's powerful initially. It doesn't last very long. So we have modifications of penicillin that make it stay around a lot longer. For example, this benzathine penicillin is like two penicillins attached together and it um and you might think oh look how low that concentration of this blood is maybe that's not a very useful antibiotic but actually it is it's long much longer lasting and uh, it's an important uh, um, ver variety or version of, of, of semi-synthetic penicillin <clears throat> so penicillinases again are probably better termed beta-lactamase and here's that beta-lactam ring that's needed for penicillin-like drugs to do their thing. And the penicillinase breaks it open, and now it's no longer uh, effective. And that's how bacteria gain resistance to uh, penicillin. <clears throat> so um, penicillinase-resistant penicillins are some of the semi-synthetics. Um, 
some uh, one strategy for for like giving amoxicillin, as we as we saw in that previous table, uh, you can look back at that. Um, it's uh, an antibiotic that's now used often with a beta lactamase inhibitor. So we just give the two drugs together, and then the one will block the, the beta lactamase, the penicillinase, and it protects the amoxicillin that can go on to do its thing of killing the bacteria. Carbapenems is a class of, of antibiotics that has a also beta lactam ring, <clears throat> but it's just in the side ring, it has a, a sulfur uh, substituted for a carbon there in the side ring, and, uh, and now it's a different drug altogether and has um, can be used for drug resistant um, um, antibiotic or bacteria. Penicillin resistant bacteria uh, can be uh, cured with, with carbapenems. <clears throat> they also have this extra double bond here. If we look back here uh, in, in the side ring of, of, over here, the side ring right here. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, I set it backwards and put a carbon in place of the sulfur that's normally found in the penicillin and, uh, and put a double bond in that ring right here. So anyway, carbapenos. Monobactams have a single ring. They have a, um, they have a um, beta lactam ring, but they don't have another ring on the side. Just another type of antibiotic uh, useful against gram negative bacteria. Pseudomonas, anything we can find against pseudomonas, right? That's important. That's a crazy bug that can survive on anything and major nosocomial problem. <clears throat> Cephalosporins. Cephalosporins are another type of beta lactam antibiotic, and um, uh, they're pretty narrow spectrum initially, but then uh, I think there's been like five generations of cephalosporins. That means that uh, we get one going and it's used clinically for a while, and the, the chemists go back to the laboratory, and a few years later they pop out another variety and so forth. So um, now we have cephalosporins that can conquer gram-negative bacteria and pseudomonads. Uh, so some pretty important drugs there. Uh, <clears throat> here's a cephalosporin. It's just got a very, very different uh, ring next to the beta-lactam ring, a uh, so-called cephalosporin nucleus, and that just gives it different properties. Bacitracin is a polypeptide antibiotic as opposed to these interesting chemicals that aren't made of amino acids at all. And it's used largely in, in a topical application with polymyxin B, as we'll see in another slide, um, against gram-positive bacteria. <clears throat> Ointments, basically. Vancomycin, super important bacteria, or super important antibiotic for um, uh, various antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Um, Staphylococcus aureus, right? Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Hit them with vancomycin. Enterococcus, uh, put, hit them with vancomycin. That's an, it's a enteric bacteria that's a very big problem in, uh, in, in dwelling catheters and biofilm formation and disease. Isoniazid and ethambutol are used against, anti, against mycobacteria, and they're usually used in combination when you're treating. Um, <clears throat> Um, tuberculosis, you'll generally use uh, two different antibiotics together that take this very slow-growing bacteria and it's a long-term, six-month-long antibiotic course and use multiple drugs to help prevent resistance from occurring during that long treatment period. <clears throat> Chloramphenicol is another, is a, we already mentioned, a protein synthesis inhibitor. Um, but something else we're going to bring to light in this slide Chloramphenicol can get inside of cells. A lot of antibiotics work on bacteria that are in the body, fluids and so forth, and, uh, and that's where they usually need to be to gain access. But we know that there are some intracellular parasites. Rickettsias uh, and Ehrlichias are intracellular parasites and chlamydias, so we need an antibiotic that can get inside the cell, and that's where chloramphenicol shines. <clears throat> can be uh, toxic in, in high doses, so it's Uses an IV antibiotic, you have to be careful, especially in children. We don't produce uh, too high of a blood concentration of it. It can be toxic. And there's chloramphenicol. Chemically, you don't need to memorize that. Just <laughs> chemistry is fun, right? So we put some nice diagrams in there. Aminoglycosides. Um, streptomycin, you may have heard of. It's pretty, pretty um, commonly mentioned in antibiotic. Neomycin and gentamicin fall in the same family. Uh, Broad-spectrum antibiotics that uh, are protein synthesis inhibitors also interfere with it. We, that's right, we did mention that in the context of the 30S subunit. Um, these guys are 
hard on the kidneys. And so they have a downside there. But sometimes you have to make trade-offs, as we've mentioned many times before, when someone is has a, a antibiotic-resistant uh, bacterial infection, sometimes they have to say, well, we're going to have to go for it and, and do a treatment. Um, the usual strategy is to try not to give these for long periods of time, give a relatively short treatment to uh, to make sure we don't have too much nephrotoxicity. Nephron, incidentally, if you haven't taken physiology, is in anatomy and physiology, is the um, functional unit of the kidneys that makes urine. So nephron means kidney toxicity there. <clears throat> Another thing to think about is you can use these aminoglycosides, but don't use them in combination with another drug that's already hard on the kidneys, like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories tend to be kind of hard on the kidneys, and they're often used in, in all kinds of clinical settings to reduce pain and fever. Uh, better discontinue it when you're going to use an aminoglycoside. Tetracyclines. <clears throat> Tetracycline also penetrates into cells, so it's important uh, antibiotic for intracellular parasites. Uh, again, you already saw how it interferes with protein synthesis in that diet, in that cartoon. And there's tetracycline, right? Tetracycline. Rings, four rings. That's what the tetracycline stands for. Glycyl cyclines. So yet another back to, uh, another antibiotic that is was scrounged up by, by researchers when we have this growing problem with uh, antibiotic resistance and so more and more uh, antibiotics are being sought and discovered that can uh, provide a remedy for those situations. So one is these glycyl cyclines, uh, useful for methicillin-resistant uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus and uh, S. acinetobacter baumannii. Um, you can probably grow some S. acinetobacter bacter in the laboratory. You probably already are. This. Somebody must have it in their unknowns. <coughs> protein synthesis inhibitor. <coughs> Another protein synthesis inhibitor, macrolides. Erythromycin, and, and especially now, another a later generation macrolide, azithromycin, very important uh, antibiotics as we continue to march through this uh, world of changing bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Um, here's a, a, a picture of a macrolide antibiotic, really interesting. Look at the size of that ring. How complex are these things? And yet, uh, microorganisms can make them for some reason, and we can get them and use them to our advantage. Imagine trying to synthesize something like that with a macro. <clears throat> Streptogramins, um, uh, useful against gram-positive bacteria. Um, so we have gram-positive bacteria that have been treated with penicillins and uh, they became resistant. Penicillin derivatives became resistant. Vancomycin was the stand-in to try to, um, to, to, for a long time, to tackle these resistant bacteria. Now we have vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and Enterococcus. So we're, every time we get a new, really good remedy, then over a period of time, as we continue to use these in the in the clinic, um, we get resistance. Now I will mention uh, that I've noticed a lot of people that talk about this subject uh, will say that the reason we have antibiotic resistance is because of misuse of antibiotics. Well, that's somewhat true, but I think that over time, use of antibiotics will lead to it to resistance. So. It's not just misuse. It's the fact is if you bring these things into the clinic and we have many, many sick people and we're doing a lot of treatments, eventually the chances are we're going to wind up with some resistance. Some bacteria will be selected for mutations are constantly happening. We're going to wind up with some resistant uh, species or strains. Oxazolidinones, um, uh, they are also protein synthesis inhibitors for, again, just another remedy. We got this antibiotic resistant problem, MRSA. Uh, we can kill those off with these particular antibiotics. <clears throat> Pleuromutilins, mushrooms, a source from a mushroom. Again, just another thing, another uh, um, um, uh, weapon in the armamentarium against these methicillin-resistant staph aureus and other antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Lipopeptides. Now, these guys are going to harm the plasma membrane instead of working like all these other ones, these protein synthesis inhibitors. So we've been to the cell wall inhibitors, we've been to protein synthesis inhibitors, now we're talking about plasma membrane disruptors, lipopeptides, right? The cell membrane is phospholipids. Lipid uh, chemicals can uh, damage the cell membrane, in this case, another way 
to get out some bacteria that they can't be beat by their protein synthesis inhibitors or their cell wall uh, synthesis inhibitors. Well, maybe we could get them by blowing up their membrane, dissolving their membrane. <clears throat> Polymyxin B is used top topically, as I mentioned earlier. So along with um, uh, bacitracin and neomycin, makes a nice uh, triple antibiotic uh, ointment that's often used for first aid. So if you go to the drugstore and get some first aid ointment, it'll have these uh, antibiotics in it. <clears throat> All right, another, top, another method, mechanism of action. Rifamycin inhibits RNA synthesis. So it's good against uh, tuberculosis. Um, so that's a, it's an RNA synthesis inhibitor. Uh, quinolones and fluoroquinolones. I mentioned ciprofloxacin earlier. It's a drug that I thought you might have heard of. Cipro is a nickname for it. It was uh, used a lot in military uh, applications, and it's, uh, it's a nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor. <clears throat> and it'll come up in our discussions later of diseases and so forth. Um, sulfonamides, those are the sulfa drugs, sulfonilamide. We've already talked about those. They inhibit uh, folic acid synthesis, dihydrofolate synthesis. Um, here's just a reminder. Here's a, this a little cartoon that we've actually looked at before uh, showing uh, the difference between a competitive inhibitor and a non-competitive inhibitor. Competitive inhibitors, like the sulfa drugs, they bind to the to the to the enzyme in such a way, a particular enzyme in the metabolic pathway that the substrate, the, the real substrate, can't get in there, and it blocks the production of whatever uh, intermediate chemical that this, this the met metabolic pathway is trying to produce. And here's a more detailed drawing. You don't need to memorize this, but you, um, this is a common pathway in producing uh, folic acid. And you can see sulfa drugs working here at this step. Um, and then we see trimethoprim working at a, a subsequent step in the same pathway. They're just metabolic competitive inhibitors. And that's how they block uh, bacteria from growing. All right. Antifungal drugs. All right now we're trying to find how can we capitalize on differences between fungi and the eukaryotic, their eukaryotic cells. How can we differentiate between uh, poisons that will block them from doing their thing and not uh, damaging the host cells? So um, polyenes uh, are going to help us uh, uh, block uh, uh, synthesis of the cell wall components in um, amphotericin B as a brand name of, of, a, of a particular drug that blocks um, reproduction of fungal cells. <clears throat> Um, so they, uh, I think they, ergosterol, that's what I forgot to mention. Um, polyenes like amphotericin B, ergosterol is a, an important uh, constituent of the cell membranes of fungi, whereas in, in our eukaryotic cells of our bodies, it would be cholesterol, forms that, uh, serves that same purpose. But since there's that difference, a chemical difference between ergosterol and, ch and cholesterol, we can exploit that in amphotericin B will will pre prevent the synthesis of ergosterol that's needed for those cell membranes. Pretty cool. Another um, ergosterol synthesis inhibitor is azoles, another family of drugs of a different chemical makeup. Um, and these are really important drugs. They might seem a little odd in sound, but I would like you to get familiar with the name of these drugs and we'll be they'll be coming up. All of these will be coming up in specific instances as we study the various diseases of, of Different organ systems in the body, but uh, these are these each have different properties that make them uh, useful for for different types of infections and different types of patients in terms of their immune system function and so forth. <clears throat> Allylamines. Here we're getting the same problem. Azol resistant uh, fungi. What do we do? There's a, a, a another ergosterol synthesis inhibitor that uh, works by a different principle, different chemical kind of construction. Um, Inhibiting cell wall synthesis, echinocandins, um, important uh, for pneumocystisae. Remember, we said pneumocystis is that one that's really important as a uh, an important problem in people with immunocompromise. Um, we use it against uh, Candida albicans, pneumocystis um, inhibits that beta glucan. Remember, we said that um, chitin and glucans are parts of the are components of the cell wall of, of fungi. Flucytosine, <clears throat> it's a cytosine analog. It interferes with RNA synthesis. So we're going to talk more about um, nucleic acid or, or nucleotide analogs as inhibitors of, of, um, of microbes. Pentamidine 
isothionate, anti-pneumocystis drug. I'm not 100% sure what the mechanism of action of that one is, but it has something to do with inhibiting um, nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, Griseofulvin, it griseofulvin in, interferes with microtubule formation, so that's another uh, anti-fungal. Uh, Dermatophytes are fungi that, that grow on the, on the superficial layers of skin. The outer layers of the epidermis is what they eat. They eat keratins of the keratinocytes in the outer parts of the epidermis. So this is a, a treatment for that kind of a problem. <clears throat> Telnaftate is another uh, topically used uh, antifungal drug. You've probably heard of it. Um, if you have um, athlete's foot infection, you can treat it with telnaftate. Uh, which will kill those fungal cells and you can restore your, your skin. There's sprays that have in there. Uh, you can use it actually preventatively to uh, keep your, your toes all in shape, the skin of your toes in between the toes. <clears throat> Here's an interesting thing. Acyclovir. I love this one. How ingenious. Acyclovir is a um, deoxyguanosine analog. So guanine is here um, and a cyclovir will substitute for it when when the cell tries to make this completed <clears throat> phosphorylated version of guanine. Um, a cyclovir will step in there and and block that from from properly happening. And so it's an inhibitor of producing the nucleotide needed for nucleic acid synthesis in virally infected cells. Well, how in the world does that work? It's the coolest thing. So in a normal, in a, in a eukaryotic cell, our, the host, our body cells, um, acyclovir is not selected or recognized by the thymidine kinase is, the, is what puts the phosphate group, it's the last finishing touch on making the nucleotide. And so it's okay, we can put the antibiotic in, doesn't have any harm to a normal healthy cells. The minute they get infected with a herpes simplex, a human herpes virus type one or type two, <clears throat> The herpes virus has its own thymidine kinase. And that thymidine kinase does grab a cyclovir and, and phosphorylate it to make, th it's thinking it's making uh, nucleus nucleotides, but it's making a bad nucleotide that cannot be used. It'll block um, nucleic acid synthesis. So in our virally infected cell, a whole bunch of this aberrant, this false nucleotide is produced, and then that stops all nucleic acid synthesis. So that cell is going to die, but that's okay. It's an infected cell. We'll let that go. All the normal healthy cells are not affected, so it's a way of uh, <clears throat> using the difference in the thymidine kinase of the virus compared to the, no the one in the, in the host cell, uh, exploit that difference and, uh, and end up blocking uh, nucleic acid synthesis in that infected cell. So interesting. Protease inhibitors, um, viruses, we haven't really mentioned this much, but in the life cycle of viruses, certain viruses, they produce polypeptides that are made up of more than one protein that ultimately needs to be used in a different way in the, in the virus particle. And so they have proteases, they carry with them proteases, which are enzymes that, that break down proteins. In this case, they break very specific bonds and so they can produce the mature proteins. Well, therefore, protease inhibitors can stop the maturation of the virus particles. So with human immunodeficiency virus, indinavir can, <clears throat> the protease inhibitor that prevents mature virions from forming. Integrase inhibitors, remember we said that the big important thing that, um, that retroviruses, including HIV, do is in inserting their genome into the chromosome of the host. That's called integration, excuse me. And so integrase inhibitors are exploiting that specific enzyme of the virus that's needed for it to do that step in its life cycle. Um, entry inhibitors, amantadine can prevent influenza from getting into cells. So you can stop the spread of it by, by using this, uh, this entry inhibitor. <clears throat> Fusion inhibitors, sinamivir can block influenza from uh, getting into the cells. Um, CCR5 is a receptor that HIV will use on its, its target cells, the, uh, the CD4 positive um, um, lymphocytes also have the CCR5. You block that CCR5 that can prevent the, uh, the, in, the, um, the HIV virus from fusing with the membrane of the host cell. So very cool stuff also. So you get the idea that there's a lot of different 
strategies for attacking HIV. And usually when people have HIV infection, several drugs that have different mechanisms of action are used in combination. Um, the so-called highly active antiretroviral uh, therapy. Um, so, all right, preventive viruses spread to the new cells, alpha interferon. We already talked about how it prevents neighboring cells from becoming infected when there's a viral infection in epithelial layer, for example. Well, amiquimod is a, a chemical that promotes interferon production, so it just ramps up that process and helps prevent the spread of viruses. <clears throat> Antiprotozoan drugs, moving to a whole other sort of uh, area of, of, of antibiotics. Chloroquine is used for malaria, prevents DNA synthesis. It's been around for a long time. There's quite a lot of chloroquine, re chloroquine resistant malaria now. Uh, artemisinin uh, was discovered, which is an important thing because trying to, again, find alternatives for chloroquine. Um, kills the sporozoites, the, the, the sexually reproducing. Uh, um, um, speed agents or, or life cycle components of, of plasmodium uh, apicomplexans. Metronidazole interferes with anaerobic metabolism, which is part of the, the metabolism of, of, of these parasites, trichomonas and giardia, that we've talked about. Metronidazole actually has quite a broad use in a lot of different um, um, anaerobic um, uh, parasites and anaerobic um, <clears throat> pathogens. Niclosamide, niclosamide, I meant to say, uh, for against tapeworms, as you can see. Um, Prezaquantel, that was, I think, brought up in one of our, our clinical um, stories at the end of one of the chapters, uh, can be used to fight against flatworms. Um, Mabendazole is a really important anti-roundworm uh, remedy. Uh, that did come up also, I think, once we mentioned it in the context of when we talked about roundworms. Ivermectin, uh, an anti-roundworm uh, antibiotic as well. <clears throat> Some terminology, we actually have seen these uh, terms before, but minimal inhibitory concentration and minimal bacteria bactericidal concentrations. Some, uh, some concentrations, some antibiotics will stop the growth of a bacterium, but then at a higher concentration, it may kill. And so those are things to distinguish uh, between. Um, so here we have a way of testing for the effectiveness of a particular antibiotic by placing it in a little porous paper disc and placing it on a, on a petri dish that's been inoculated in such a way that it will grow a lawn, a confluent lawn of bacteria on the entire surface. And wherever the antibiotic was, was able to block the growth, we'll see a clear area. And so the bigger the clear area, the more effective the antibiotic was as it diffused out. Right? We really have a concentration gradient, highest near the disc, and, and, and it'll reduce concentrations to go farther and farther out. And the farther out the, the antibiotic is able to inhibit uh, the growth of the bacteria, the more effective, the more strong antibiotic is against that particular microorganism. In other words, a lower concentration is needed to inhibit growth. So that's pretty cool. The thing about this, though, is you can't tell the difference between um, inhibitory doses versus bactericidal doses. And sometimes you would like to know. And so different types of assays are needed to see if we've killed the bacteria. You can imagine what we could do. We could uh, see if a, a subsequent culture of, uh, if we mix some bacteria with a particular dose we want to test of the antibiotic and wait overnight and then take a, make a subculture into some fresh media with no antibiotic, we could, and then if it grows, we'll realize that it was bacteria static. So that's a concept we've encountered before, but it's a way we can solve the question of, oh, which is happening here? <clears throat> Here's a cool thing where instead of just having discs, you actually buy uh, antibiotics impregnated on these strips in, in, a, in a concentration gradient. So high concentration up here at the top and lower concentration down here at the bottom and place them again on a, on a plate that's been inoculated with bacteria in such a way that a lawn would form. And we can look and see where is the minimum uh, concentration of antibiotic that will prevent growth. Min minimum inhibitory concentration of different antibiotics. And you say, okay, this one. You know, we, can, we know what dose we can use to, um, to, to take care of a particular patient's and, uh, um, my, microbes. Again, sometimes the microbes are resistant to antibiotics. We don't really know what's the best thing to use and at what concentration. We can set up an assay like this with multiple different antibiotics and test them and see what concentrations will be effective. 
against the particular pathogen of the day. <clears throat> Another way to test, do a dilution series of antibiotics. This is a, is a micro titer plate, it's called. Uh, they come in 96 well formats or 386, 384 well formats with tiny plastic wells. You can put uh, some antibiotics in different concentrations in series of wells and then inoculate them with with um, with microbes and see where they can and can't grow so in this top row you can see that doxycycline was not able to kill any bacteria at any concentration and that's because those guys were uh, were resistant uh, sulfamethoxazole however was able to kill or at least inhibit growth and, uh, and again we could culture out and see whether they were dead or not streptomycin very powerful in all of the concentrations tested there's no bacterial growth in any of these and you get the idea it's a way of screening different mic different um, antibiotics for effectiveness against a particular microorganism. <clears throat> Here's just a little graph showing um, growth of bacteria after treatment with antibiotics, and we can see that the the, the, the amount of bacteria uh, present is declining, numbers per mil, and uh, so we have some, something effective is happening. And then all of a sudden, the bacterial count starts to rise again. And that's because antibiotics resistance has, has occurred. And so now no dose, the dose of bacteria needed to control these things is shown here on this axis. And it's going up and up and up until it's, there's no effective concentration to control these things. They're resistant. <clears throat> so mutations, as well as selection from among a population can lead to in, uh, resistance to antibiotics. And the resistance genes, there's often some specific genes that give the microbes properties that we'll, we'll take a look at in just a second that can make them resistant. And they can acquire those through horizontal transfer, through plasmids or transposons or, or, um, or lysogeny. And so those are things that, um, but oftentimes plasmids have more than one even resistance marker on them. And they can be transferred from bacterium to bacterium and make, and so we're getting into this multi-drug resistant problem because of plasmids that can be transferred. So here's a list of things to avoid doing if you want to prevent uh, a resistance from occurring quickly in, in the context of a particular antibiotic. Um, never use outdated or weakened antibiotics because those just, they have some selective pressure on the bacteria that they don't kill, and then any resistant ones can start to become selected for and grow up in the, in the, in the host body <clears throat> and now you have resistance. Um, using antibodies, antibiotics for the wrong reasons. So using antibiotics a lot in the population will eventually lead to resistance. And if people are taking antibiotics for colds, right, people get a cold and they're not educated about biology. They go to the doctor and they demand, I want antibiotics. My child is sick. I want you to give them some prescribed antibiotics. The doctor knows that antibiotics for bacteria don't do anything for viruses. But yet, oftentimes, in order to get the people out of their hair, what do they do? Prescribe antibiotics. And that's a bad idea. Um, in some countries, it's just over the counter. You can just go to the drugstore and get antibiotics if you have a cold. You're like, eh, let's just make sure. What if it was a bacterial infection? I'll take some antibiotics. And hence, in those countries like India, massive antibiotic uh, drug resistance and, and, and multi-drug resistance in, in bacteria, much more so than here. <clears throat> Failing to complete the regimen. So you start out your antibiotic series. And you only take four out of seven days that it's recommended. And so again, you selected bacteria, did some harm to them, didn't kill them, and now the selected bacteria that have some semblance of resistance begin to take over the population, and, and uh, maybe even more resistant mutants will eventually arise using someone's leftover prescription, so it's probably outdated, plus there isn't enough for a full course, and you're just going to pop a few of them, and go, okay, well, it just makes me feel better. Um, probably a bad idea. <clears throat> So how is it the bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? Here's a couple of examples of mechanisms by which they can resist. Blocking entry. Um, bacteria develop the ability to prevent that antibiotic from getting into the cell um, just by mutations that take place or by genes that they acquire, um, change the properties of the cell membrane. Maybe change to a different transport protein that no longer lets the antibiotic in. Inact inactivation by enzymes, um, producing things like beta-lactamase or penicillinase, if that penicillinase is on, on a plasma, the gene for it, then this bacteria could acquire it, boom, now they can inactivate or destroy the antibiotic. Three, alteration of a target molecule. Uh, we just saw a couple of competitive inhibitors of, of enzymes in the 
folic acid synthesis pathway? What if the what if the bacteria undergoes a series of mutations and now the enzyme uh, that was the target still works uh, to catalyze the reaction? It's supposed to catalyze, but it no longer can be bound by the antibiotic, and so the, it's no longer a competitive inhibitor. <clears throat> and finally, a very important one: efflux pumps. Um, bacteria develop membrane transporters that can can remove the antibiotic from the from the cytoplasm. Those are called efflux pumps, and uh, and and they're a big problem in antibiotic resistance. So, and if you have the cells acquire a gene for a transporter that will take the antibiotic out, boom, they're resistant. Um, cephalosporin resistance and E. coli. Um, e. coli. A lot of antibiotics have been started to be added uh, some decades ago to animal feed. I'm not sure exactly when that became a thing, but um, <coughs> um, big, large-scale farm production uh, depends somewhat for efficiency on uh, preventing disease among the population of birds or animals. And so oftentimes antibiotic-laced feeds are used to suppress growth of microorganisms. Well, the problem is, what does that do? It, it produces resistance. So here's a resistance plasmid. Um, uh, for that's found in, in Salmonella enterica and turkeys. And, and here's a, a species that didn't have the, the plasmid initially. Here it is, uh, uh, Salmonella enterica strain. Oh, oh, E. coli, I'm sorry, they had the plasmid. Here's the Salmonella enterica, and by horizontal gene transfer through a plasmid, um, now the Salmonella enterica has acquired the gene. This is just a, a gel that's looking at a, a band that represents either probably either a PCR product probably a PCR product, but it could be a, a, um, a restriction fragment that illustrates the presence of that plasmid. So <clears throat> that's a way that a big problem, and this is why we went to the trouble to discuss it, horizontal gene transfer can uh, transfer uh, resistance to uh, through through in, within the same body if multiple microorganisms are there. All right. <clears throat> what have we got going on? Fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter. Bacter jejuni. Campylobacter jejuni is, is, is probably or thought to be the, or said to be, the number one cause of food poisoning in the United States. So small amounts of Campylobacter jejuni that might contaminate some meat. It's a, it's a, a fecal oral transmission thing through food. And, um, and if it gets into your digestive tract in sufficient amounts, you'll get sick. And um, so treatment with fluoroquinolone, ciprofloxacin, for example, and over years of time, look what's happening to the resistance of Campylobacter jejuni uh, for, for um, fluoroquinolones. <clears throat> Here's the date, around 1980, just before 1987, late 1987, uh, Cipro was introduced, uh, or fluoroquinolones is a general family of antibiotics, was introduced for treatment of Campylobacter, and then it started to be added to 1996. It was now added to uh, poultry food. And uh, the antibiotic resistance has just continued to climb uh, by the fact that we're using it a lot. Um, maybe we could say using it in poultry feed is not a good idea. Using it in humans, that's medicine. Sometimes we have to do that regardless, even though that eventually will probably produce resistance. But um, there's more and more growing push to not use antibiotics in feeds because we're just producing a, we're just accelerating the rate of antibiotic resistance in the, in the microbial world. And so now we've discontinued the um, um, uh, fluoroquinolones in, in poultry feed, but <coughs> now the bugs are already out there. They're in the, they're in the environment and they're everywhere. So it's not going to be easy to uh, reverse that process. Probably never can. You just need to get new antibiotics. We're always in the search for new antibiotics that work by different mechanisms so that we can overcome resistance. Definitions. Synergism means if you take two things that have an effect on their own and combine them, you get a greater effect than the sum of the two uh, separately. So I'll show you a picture in a second. Antagonism means that one antibiotic in this case could uh, inhibit the effect of the other. Um, here's a picture of synergism happen. We have a, a plate with a lawn of bacteria once again, and we have this disc diffusion method of testing antibiotic uh, effectiveness. And you can see that Antibiotics is diffusing out of this disc and diffusing out of this disc, but look at the, re, the, the the clear area is going up way higher where the two are together. So this shows that there's synergy happening. When you add these two drugs together, you get a greater uh, inhibition of bacterial growth than either one of them or than the sum of them would have been 
uh, if you just added them equally together. <clears throat> All kinds of side effects of different antibiotics occur. We've already mentioned um, chloramphenicol has toxicity. We've talked about um, aminoglycosides have uh, nephrotoxicity. Any antibiotic or any drug, any medical intervention you choose, there is going to be some risk or some downside, some side effect. You always have to do the cost-benefit analysis in each case. So we take a look at the patient. How sick are they? What's their, their prognosis? Are they in deep trouble? Uh, if so, we might take a greater risk than someone who's just got a, a run-of-the-mill infection of some kind that needs to be treated. So that's just something to always be keeping in mind when thinking about prescribing antibiotics. <clears throat> Future antimicrobial peptides, um, trying to harness some of the, the defensins, for example, that are already produced by human cells, but other animals have antimicrobial peptides that they'd be able to start using or uh, harnessing for use uh, to fight infection in humans. Phage therapy, we know that phage have a very specific host range of bacteria. If we could uh, produce phage that will be uh, able to be introduced into a into the realm of an infection in the body, we could have those phage lice all the bacteria and voila, cure the disease. Gene silencing could provide treatments using, we talked once again, once before about small interfering RNAs. If we could use a vector to deliver small interfering RNAs that would um, call, take away a, an important uh, messenger RNA from, from a, from a uh, pathogen cell, it wouldn't be able to grow anymore. And so we just we would introduce some DNA, a gene that produces, uh, transcribes, uh, small interfering RNAs, and now here's the message RNA of an important gene within the bacteria, and now or within some eukaryotic cell even, and it's going to chop up the, the messenger RNA, and there's no more expression, and now that cell can't, you know, grow without the, whatever critical gene that was that uh, it was trying to produce. So that's our story. A really wonderful chapter. A lot of things in it, but it's um it's very cool because it's very meaty. This is the this is right at the point of treatment of life threatening uh, potentially diseases all these antibiotics and fighting this constant battle of, of resistance and so forth. So I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Uh, and we'll go on to talk about our first um, diseases specifically in the next chapter, diseases of the skin and eye.